All right, everyone. Welcome to the session on MongoDB and Java 8. Um, we will be talking today, well, for 15 minutes, not too long, not to bother you during your lunch. No worries about that. But how we are supporting or how we can integrate our new coolest application built on top of Java 8 and connect it to our you know, favorite database of choice, which obviously, as you might be here sitting down, is MongoDB. Now, uh, we're going to be looking into the main features of Java 8, how we can integrate with MongoDB, a uh, few of the examples of code snippets that I prepared for this talk, and also talk a little bit about the reactive driver that we just recently, well, a few months ago re released, and might be very useful for you guys if you're building asynchronous applications or reactive applications on top of Java 8. So uh, there's a lot of hype today or in, during this conference about Java 9. So we are starting to understand what's coming on Java 9. And a lot of people are still migrating from Java 7 and Java 6 back to Java 8 or to Java 8 and start making use of the coolest features of Java 8. But I have to tell you firsthand that we are going to be still supporting Java 6 for a long time. Uh, Yesterday, if you guys been in the Java console, someone asked, uh, well, who's still using Java 1.2? I've seen companies still using Java 1.2 because they don't want to upgrade their system. It's too critical for them to actually fix bugs. So they, they understand their bugs, they understand limitations, and they will do, it. do you use it. And MongoDB Java driver will be still uh, compliant with 1.6 for a while. Uh, this is due to the large majority of uh, installations out there of the JVM at the end, but it, it also because of long-term compliance reasons, we will be supporting Java 6 and above for a while. So legacy code support is always going to be there. But that doesn't uh, restrain us from actually start benefiting from the new cool things that Java 8 actually brought. Um, there's plenty of, uh, there's a big list of different things that um, Java 8 brings into the table. It allows us to do a lot of uh, cool stuff, especially Lambda, uh, Lambda expressions, the um, new data API, the type annotations, uh, streams, all of those things are very, very cool. I'm going to focus on the things that I think are more important from the communication with the database like MongoDB and the things that are really important for you every time you want to process data. There's a reason why we have the Lambda uh, functions and the stream processing API and the new data API. It's to make it our lives easier when data treatment is involved, when we want to process larger amount of data, when we want to do a lot of batch processing, or we want to make sure we are using our resources wisely. We tend to use the, both of uh, these three major um, features of Java 8 to actually make our processing better. Now, Lambda function, oh, they've been here for a while. We could use uh, anonymous functions before. We just didn't call it Lambda. But the, with the new notations and the new specification, it's much easier, much more comfortable to use it. Actually, it's very similar if you are familiar with other um, languages like Python or even Ruby. You could st already start getting a feeling of how a Lambda function could be actually useful for you and do it in a java way, so a very tight uh, relationship with Java. Um, it's uh, mostly uh, allowing us to represent high order functions, making our code much more streamlined, much more well understood from a processing pipeline, let's say, standpoint. And it's functional Java for the win. So it's all the people from Scala always finger pointing us saying, hey, you're not functional enough. Java is you know, very verbose and it's slow and we don't do functional fun programming. Actually, this allows Java to be functional for the win, which is very good. And the, the simplest way to call a, jo a Lambda function will be just map or flat map or uh, do some, some other uh, kind of operation like that, where you're going to have a list of objects or a list of elements from whatever data source we have. We're going to process it in a functional way, where we're going to determine the pipeline. We're going to operate over that. And at the end, we can just store it back into MongoDB. Now, that's the most ridiculous usage of um, a database inside of a Lambda function, but that's probably the best or the most obvious one as well to actually use a Lambda function to process data. Related with it, we also have the Stream API. And the Stream API is 
where actually we get to combine these two things in a very, very close relationship and actually benefit a lot from it. Um, they allow us to specify our pipelines. We have an operation, we define a lambda function, we streamline that, define another one, and so on, and we can process it on call, being very, very lazy in terms of processing. Once you get the resources available, then you are actually going to be processing all that data. And to do that, for example, the obvious thing is to get a batch of a file, CSV or JSON file, whatever, and start reading that file, creating a stream, and then processing that. Uh, we can start by you know, defining which collection we want to use, like reading all the lines of a CSV file. We will map that file for each line we receive. We will do some filtering. We will do some skipping. You do some internal processing for each one of the lines. You can change tags, you can change names, you can change the other files, all that stuff. And then we, at the end, we need to, after processing all of that information, we need to collect the terminator operator and send it somewhere. Now, obviously, MongoDB can be one of those collectors, can be one of those terminators. After you define whatever you have in your CSV file or whatever text file you have, or even a stream from Twitter, for example, you can process all that, parse it into a BSON document or JSON object in this case, pass it on to MongoDB, and that will be the collector for you. Good thing is that streams are immutable, meaning that you can rely always on the data. And you, I don't know if you guys seen yesterday a talk on streams and Spark. Um, that's precisely where we get the benefit of doing a lot of compound processing on top of the stream and then using that over time and reusing it once we need it. So we can pipeline even streams of data and process streams of streams of streams. So that means that we can do a lot of different handling on the data depending on the processing we need. MongoDB on the equation here comes as a finalizer or a uh, terminator of those pipelines because at the end it's where you're going to persist data. The good thing is that you don't need to terminate your processing there. You can just keep on doing it and in chaining up more streams as you go along. So a, a dumb example would be to read the, all those files, get all of that data, call a range, call a list, uh, and just build documents based on that. There's also the new date API. And the new date API is basically something that we always, well, we've been, we've been dying for it for a while now. Uh, who here does like Java date util at all? No one likes it, right? So I don't understand it. Uh, you usually use it something else to process your dates. The only real thing that it does is give you the timestamp offset, and that's pretty much the only useful thing that it does. And the new date API actually supports a lot more, like say, structure in very well understood format, which is great. Now, but the new date API is only uh, available on Java 8, which is OK. How can we use it from? MongoDB, because MongoDB has its own date format. It's basically UTC format. Once you parse some data f uh, date format from Java to MongoDB, it will be processed into a uh, specific BSON uh, data type. So how can we handle these new data types that we handle from, the J from Java natively into MongoDB? Well, the, f the first thing that you probably, most of you, well, just uh, guessing that you don't know is that the Java driver, or all j j drivers in MongoDB, allow you to implement codecs. And codecs is basically mapping instructions that if you pass a particular data type or a particular attribute with a particular set of objects in it, you can immediately codec that to a format that is known to MongoDB. Like, for example, if you're, process you're passing on attributes of a document that has j the new Java data types, you can codec that information into a known data that MongoDB understands can be a binary format or can be its native timestamp. And then we can process back and forth from the application. So you're going to have your objects, your POJOs, that will have new date format. Great. You're going to have data in MongoDB that is going to be having its own format. In the meantime, the one that does all the conversions and codification and decodification will be the codec inf infrastructure that you just can expose to your driver, and it will handle all that for you. You don't need to be parsing in the meantime. So the first thing you need to do is instantiate a codec. And you can use the, the MongoDB API to do that. It's basically implementing a codec instant. Uh, instant will be the new date, uh, new date format from uh, Java 8. 
You encode that into a BSON. You, know, you get a BSON writer, get the value that you want, and just write that date time value to epoch time, for example. That's a conversion that I'm doing. Picking up the instance, getting the epoch time, and writing that into a BSON format. Very straightforward. It's going to be binary format, so we can basically use it again and again. Then you need to define your encoder. And once you have your decoder as well, we just need to do the reverse operation. If you are getting a BSON object from the database and you want to retrieve it back as an instant, you can get it for free. And the operation that does that implementation is basically that. To get everything glued up, this is not just creating this instant codec, you need to register. To register it, you need to basically instantiate it. You need to create a codec registry, define the registry rules. First of all, you need to get that information, instantiate it, register the codec registry. So we're going to tell the Java driver, look, every time you find something like this or in this data type, you will use this particular codec. We'll set it up, tell it exactly what we need to do with the codec driver, and it will register all the different um, operations that it needs to map. Then we just need to pass it along with the MongoDB client that we're going to be using. So MongoDB client is our driver instance. Basically, we'll, it's where all the communications to MongoDB or to the server will pass through. You will tell and register that particular codec on the client itself, and you just use documents as you normally do with your MongoDB uh, instances. Very, very straightforward. Every time you insert it, it will be immediately codected to the appropriate data type that we are using in MongoDB. When you get or find, it will parse all that information for you. It's very, very straightforward, very linear. And you also can abstract all of this and get in your architects just to build and define the structure of data that you want to be stored in, in the database, and you have your developers using the new Java 8 API, no problem. It's very clean for the developer's perspective. There's also the new Rx uh, driver, which is a reactor driver. And the reactor drivers are uh, something that is very, very now um, on demand because we want to do everything asynchronous or reactive or make sure that we don't wait for anything that is happening on our processing. We just want to do as much as possible on CPU uh, as your uh, server is allowing you to do. So the first thing that we do in the new uh, reactive X is to implement the pattern of observable in our server. It's basically uh, it's implementing a simple interface on next, on error, and on complete. Uh, it, it maintains the communication back to MongoDB, tell, uh, tails the upload, tails whatever actions are happening on the server itself, and makes sure it can react to the operations. If you want to try it out and you want to build some uh, reactive streams as well, can use this driver. I uh, recommend you all to go there and, um, and look at it. It does implement cold observ observables, so it's it's uh, the pattern that we are implementing for this particular uh, implementation. It also can support back pressure, so which is good if something is happening on your server and you don't have enough resources. It will actually allow you to uh, optimize the processing for it. Well, I only have two minutes left. I just want to tell you, if you want to learn more about how to use the codecs and how to use this implementation with Java 8 and with other stuff with MongoDB, you can always join our courses. They are for free. The next lessons start on the 5th of January uh, and go till the 23rd. So you can disguise yourself and do for Carnival and do some of the uh, MongoDB lessons. It's, I'm pretty sure it would be fun. Um, I'll be on the QA, uh, doing a QA session, an unofficial DevOps QA session on MongoDB. In the main hallway, there's a whiteboard somewhere that has this tag on it. Uh, I'll be there if you have any other uh, for the questions for it. We are also hiring, obviously, if you want to join and, and say, oh, well, MongoDB doesn't do a lot of good support for Java, and I can do it better. You can always show for it. So apply. We are more than happy to have you on our team. And if you have other further questions, or you can always, yeah, it's, the slide is broken. Welcome PowerPoint. So uh, you can always tag along with my Twitter account or just drop me an email. And if you want to see the examples themselves, you have the GitHub repository. Thank you so much.